Hi, and welcome to the Indie Music Podcast, the podcast for independent musicians and other audio professionals. We're your hosts. I'm Matt Denton, also known as Mojo of Ragged Birds Music. I'm a Bay Area mix engineer and recording artist. And Douglas Reynolds of Resonance Mastering, a mastering engineer in Bloomington, Illinois. Welcome to Indie Music Podcast, episode 215. Tonight, Matt and Doug chat with Andy Stover, independent musician and producer out of Indiana. We talk about Andy's upcoming release, Not Too Late, due out on all major platforms April 12th. We talk about his writing and production process, inspiration for his songwriting, his home studio, genres of music, and get to play some tracks from the upcoming album. We had a lot of fun recording and know you'll enjoy this episode too. Hey, check, check. Andy. Hey, what's up? Hey, (laughs) he's here. How are we doing, guys? We're doing great. Doing great. How are you? Doing good. I'm sitting here trying to figure out how I can manage to record and write an album on my own, but not figure out how to use a simple phone. But hey, you know, that's okay. (laughs) (laughs) Part of part, all part of the process. Am I right? Exactly. Yeah. If it was like a plugin, if Zoom was a plugin, if we could get Zoom as like a VST. Oh, dude, that would be awesome. (laughs) I think Reaper, which I have, actually has something like that. It, it's similar. It's where um, I forget exactly what the plugin's called, but you can actually get online with it and like collaborate with musicians, and they can pick up where you left off on a project. It's pretty neat, really. Cool. I use Reaper too, and I know what you're talking about, but I can't remember the Recast, name of the plugin. Recast. That's what it is. Yeah. Recast. Yeah. Yep. So how long have you used Reaper? Uh, since Reaper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. One version one, I guess. Yeah, just a, a long time. I don't remember what version I, I started on. Out in like '62. How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> it's just joking. No, I've been using it for about the uh, three years now that I've been mixing, um, and I love it. I, um, to be honest, I went with it because it had a free trial at the beginning, and then yeah. after that, as does everybody. Yeah, after that, I loved it and uh, purchased the license, which is very, very, very reasonable priced. And um, if you ask me, it comes with everything you need. It's a very light download. Like there's barely, you know, it doesn't take a lot to download it, which is good for us home musicians because like myself, I'm, I'm recording and mixing and mastering on a, on a little laptop here. And um, you know, if I had something big like pro tools or all that, you know, maybe I would crash more or something. So yeah, that was another big plus. (laughs) Yeah. and, And the other thing is, is that, you know, whenever asked is that the answer is always, yeah, Reaper does that. (laughs) Yes. It doesn't come with all the, uh, you know, what I call bloatware, all the extra uh, instruments and stuff I would never use anyway. But I guess that's why it's a light download. Right, right. Yeah. But guys, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here with everybody. Yeah, we're excited to talk to you. We're uh, interested to hear how you did produce and uh, record and mix your album that's coming out. Yes, yes. Yeah, tell us, actually, let's start out with a. So you got an album coming out. Tell us uh, uh, what's the name of the album and okay, cool. a little bit about it. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got an album coming out on uh, this May 12th. It is called Not Too Late. Um, this will be my first full-length album that I've ever put out. I have a EP out now, but this is my first full-length. So I'm super excited about that. Um, it's an eight-song album. And um, there's also a song on the album called Not Too Late. And that's kind of where I came up with the title. And so you've done this complete all the entire production is you solo so working at ab- home. absolutely me in a room the end result as everybody will hear when we play a song sounds like a full band playing um but it's me playing every instrument every note from every instrument all the vocals i wrote the songs um i recorded everything myself here in my home studio i mixed and mastered everything myself um in my home studio here and it was a heck of a learning process but i am so glad i did it and it can be done, guys. Yep, it sure can. So do you have like a um, kind of like a workflow process now? Yeah, um, mine isn't probably going to be maybe like the best advice to take, but maybe like so people can get a little look at how I, I do it. It might not be the quote unquote right way. But with me um, not being traditionally taught and just kind of learning on my own, um, I use it how I use it um, if I'm like songwriting and stuff, my work flow process is I'll be in the middle like all at the same time I could be writing the song recording a few of the tracks and letting the song evolve all kind of all at once you know what I mean um but with this last album that I did I didn't do that I had all the songs wrote already um and what I like to do is I go in and I program all my drums first to the particular track that I'm working on um and make sure I get those working correctly with all the fills and, and everything in the right places 
And then from there, I'll build up with um, up my uh, rhythm guitars and uh, bass and just, you know, everything from there. Work my way up, uh, get everything tracked. And um, once I have everything edited and tracked, I like to do a um, where I turn everything down. And I do a good volume balance the best as I can. That's a very good way to start. The, um, I've learned through the few years I've been doing this is before you touch any plugins, before you touch anything like that, just get a great volume balance. And ever since I've started doing that, my mixes have improved greatly. Yeah, actually. That, that alone is very good advice. Yeah, and then some more advice that I took on this album. This is the first time that I took this approach. But with this album, I tried something called top-down mixing. Okay. Which I'm sure you guys are very familiar with. But um, for anybody that's not, it's basically you do your volume balance like I was talking about. And um, from there, you might move to some mixed bus processing. Um, I don't throw a whole lot at my mixed bus, uh, just a little EQ and compression usually. And uh, from there, I move on to my individual tracks. I'm sorry, from there, I move on to my buses. And then from buses, individual tracks. And uh, from there, hopefully a masterpiece emerges. <laughs> <laughs> and it's that easy, right, fellas? That is absolutely. It should take like, what, five, ten minutes? Five, ten minutes. <laughs> I think I Recording um, the song Not Too Late that we'll hear. Uh, I think that took me about two months to finish. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yes. How long have you guys been doing the mixing and mastering? Uh, a little over 10 years for me. So you guys started the analog field. Yeah, I started in about 1989 in mixing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you guys have your I started own studios? Too? Just like you did, I started out uh, basically on a laptop in the box, um, writing, recording mixing, mastering all uh, myself. That was back in like uh, 2009. It was kind of un a little bit unheard of then. It was all self-taught. Sure. Um, yeah, and the stuff you're talking about now was, yeah, definitely advanced stuff that I took a while to get around to uh, to learning and figuring out. Wasn't a whole did lot of you internet guys then. <laughs> any of the like, traditional schooling at all, or did you guys do it kind of how I'm doing the process and trying to learn everything as I go? I started out winding up cables. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. So you put it in work. Correct? No, you paid your real dues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Yes. I walked into a a pro sound company that we had here in town, and I just told them that I'd like to help out. And so they sent me down the basement after the uh, after the guys would bring all the gear back and throw it in on the floor down there, and uh, they had me clean and organize and roll up everything so it was ready for the next gigs. Sure. So basically, I just started with the broom, right and sweeping things up, and uh, and and the first thing I learned about was cables nice. and how to roll up cables. You know, so you know, I didn't it. even know you that. <laughs> yeah, a lot of that is like it. It seems kind of you know meaningless to think about on the surface, but like think about it. Like all those little things you learned along the way have really like helped mold your craft. Like you know how to take care of cords now. You know you're not buying yeah. cords every five weeks. You know what I mean? I know if you get. If you just put yourself in and around the stuff that you're interested in, even if you don't know how to do it, and you surround yourself with people who know how to do it, you know, that stuff can just creates opportunities for you to kind of grow into it. So, you know, you, you just set yourself up for these things. Yeah, absolutely. And especially like when it's when it's something that you're into, or for me anyway, like like music. I've always wrote music and played music my entire life, but just the last three years got serious and started learning how to record and stuff. But if it's something that you're interested in, like you can run with it. It really doesn't take that long. It doesn't feel like work because you're loving it every step of the way, you know? Right, right. And um, I don't know if if you will ever, any one person will ever have it all. Like I'm sure it's something you continuously are learning with through, through your whole life, I'm sure. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Did you guys do um, recording on um, analog gear then? I did not. I did. You did? Yep, you okay, did. you were always in the box. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, I didn't know then, any uh, any any pros or cons that you cared to speak about. Because I, I was thinking about going hybrid and getting a little like pre mixing desk. I mean, I would go with whatever works for you and, and uh, um, get you the results that you want. I guess... Using the analogy of childbirth, uh, I've been trying to get back in the box ever since. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's hilarious. If you don't mind, I'm going to use that. <laughs> that. That was perfect. That was perfect. Yeah. But I no, think if you were going to do um, something like that, I, I, would, I would suggest having a, a good reason to do it. Because if you have a workflow and it's working for you and you're producing music and you're enjoying it, um, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know why you would want to go 
the other That's direction. That's a good segue into something else I was going to get into um, is that you you don't need, I keep hearing this and I, and I've proven this true now. I didn't believe it at the beginning of this, that it, you don't need, it's not, your mixes aren't good because you don't have the right expensive studio monitors. They're not, your mixes aren't good because you don't have the fancy expensive uh, plugins. You know what I mean? That yeah. really, you have to learn the crap yeah. first. Get, buying new expensive gear isn't going to usually fix the issue. Is that correct? Uh, but knowing the gear that you do have very well makes a difference. Absolutely. There you go. That because I have guys, and and I want to say this in case there's some other home studio musicians out there, maybe in the same boat as me. Um, I am in a square small room, which we all know is not ideal for recording. Um, I do have a little bit of acoustic paneling up, but I have some 1990s studio monitors. I have a Scarlett Solo Focus Right, which only gives me two connections for my interface, mm -hmm. and and an old guitar, and that's about it. And I've been able to learn everything with that, um, learn the gear I have, and I've been able to produce some decent sounding music, in my opinion. You know, I, I'm a big fan of the Scarlet interfaces. I had an 18 I hate for the longest time. Yeah. The mic preamps are really good. They're priced at a level that gets, makes introduction into recording yourself a little bit easier. Absolutely. They're not the most expensive microphone preamps available and interfaces and uh and but they're nice and they're clean right and they do i think they do a really good job mine was virtually trouble free for all the years i had uh, had that 18 and i ate for at least three years I think. yeah they're very yeah. affordable yeah. and uh yeah they're definitely solid and sound good and matt what do you use I uh, i have remember. a presonus i i never did Pre get into the 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 focus right because i started with a presonus and then i stayed with a presonus but i um i i know a lot of people that use the focus right um and they're very happy with them yeah and the presonus is, is comparable to the focus right in my opinion. yeah very similar uh similar price point also has two interfaces uh or two inputs i mean the nice clean um preamps no complaints. They have great sounding preamps. And then the one that I have also has the uh, switch where you can switch the uh, one to the air. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Which I guess is um, supposed to be designed like one of their better preamps, I guess. Um, yeah. It kind of opens up the top end a, sure, a little bit. Sure. Quite a bit. Quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and it, it sounds nice depending on what you're putting through it. So getting into your, into your songwriting. And I think one of the things that I was interested in is how you're motivated or where your inspiration is for starting your songwriting process. Sure. Sure. Um, I could get into that for sure. So usually my inspiration comes from um, life events, you know, life knocks on the head, um, different things like that, um, that aren't always pretty but need to be, those emotions need to be processed. And my inspiration comes a lot from different events like that. Not to say that all my songs are these sad, gloomy songs, but, you know, some of my inspiration comes from that. And then a lot of my other songwriting inspiration comes from just, just listening to other musicians that I, that I love and, and picking up little things that they do and getting in there. And that paired with, you know, life events or world events just, Luckily, being able to get in there and just roll with it from there. Do you start with, once you have that inspiration, is that musical inspiration? Is it lyrical inspiration? Okay, and, so is usually it... what comes first for me is is musical. I'll come up with a lick or I'll come up with a chord progression that I like. And um, I'll stick with that as my bass. And then it's funny. So if you were in my living room while I was writing a song, you would hear me and my acoustic because <laughs> I'm playing the uh, progression that I came up with. And uh, what's supposed to be words at first, just trying to find a melody, but I might just be shouting half words or something just to kind of fill the melody. It's really kind sure, of funny sure. to hear. But um, from there, I'll once I get that uh, progression down and a good idea of how the song's going to go musically, I then um, am able to write lyrics to it because I know how to fit the words and syllables and all that from there is how I do it. I know there are some musicians that do their lyrics first. I haven't had much luck with that myself. It's harder. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's much yeah, easier to have a track and do vocalization and then write the write the words to the song. I have way. had I have had like you know maybe a, a chorus 
of lyrics wrote first, you know, and from there been able to do it, but I've never been able to write the lyrics completely. Um, and, but I'll tell you what, I take that back. There's one example and it's my song, Not Too Late, which is also the name of my album that's coming out on May 12th. So it's a self-titled song. That song was, is very, very special to me. And I did have those lyrics first, but that was like a big traumatic life event. So that was kind of different with that one. Let me ask you real quick on what that was, topic. Uh, yeah. What, did you find uh, that the lyrics evolved because you wrote them first and you had to later fit them to music? Or did were you able to write the music um, and keep the lyrics more or less the same? There was a, more or less I was able to keep them, but there was a little bit of change, having to change words. Um, they basically said the same thing, just right. maybe fit better. <laughs> yeah, I find the music. Yeah, yeah not, not too much, luckily. I was able to able to luck out on that one so what was the um the inspiration okay not too late sure um like i was talking about some of the um uh tougher life events that happened well this was one of them so the song not too late and the album honestly the whole idea of the song and the lyrics in the song talk about um three years ago i had a, a best friend that i used to work with uh he was my age and you could tell he was starting to go through some life struggles and stuff. It was starting to show. Um, he kept calling me a lot and was down in his luck and all that. And then the next day I came into work and find out he had um, let it all get to him and he committed suicide that night. And that same night he was calling me on my phone and I was too tired and going to bed and I didn't answer the phone. Mm -hmm. So the song yeah. lyrics are kind of about my guilt with that. Um, and how I'll never let that happen again. I'll answer the phone anytime somebody calls um, yeah. and just how it, how the loss was and just trying to remember him and how it's important to, to check in and talk with your friends. Um, that's where the idea came from. And that's what the lyrics spell out as well. Did you, did you start in on the song right away? Was it, was it something that you were... I had an idea that it was going to happen. I mean, you know, but it wasn't until I was able to process a lot of that guilt, maybe six or seven months later, that I was able to finally sit down and get through a songwriting uh, process to do it. Um, so it was about six or eight months after the fact. It's such a, it's such a sad thing and such a prevalent problem it, in, in society. Did. Yeah. And we hear about it every day. And Far I think, too often. Yeah, and probably anybody could say that someone they know or their friends, family, they've been directly affected by by suicide. Yeah, and my we definitely want to say that there's there's help out there. Sure, and I think we should probably post. Yeah, I was going to say we should probably put the a link resource on exactly, the show notes. We're do that. Yeah. Great idea, guys. Yeah. That's a, that's there a, there is idea. help out there. There are people to talk to. You can even reach out to us, frankly, on, on social or whatever. Um, and that's kind of what the song says, too, towards the second verse, as you'll hear the lyrics say, you know, in the name of the song is, you know, we can work out your problems. Just come talk to me, guys, because as of right now, it is not too late. Right. Right. Why don't we... Do you have that? Um, yeah, yeah. You guys ready? Yeah, let's, yeah. Uh, let's, yeah, let's 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 hear. It. Would you want to play a little bit let's of that? Yeah, here we go, guys. Want we'll, me we'll just play yeah, a little let's... bit of it or the whole thing? No, go ahead. I think we got time for yeah. the whole thing. All right, here it goes, guys. Here is not too late.
Uh, that was nice. Yeah, I think it's a great message, you know, and and it's actually it's upbeat. Yeah, yeah, sure. From where the uh, the inspiration drew from, and and that whole situation. I try you know. to do that purposely because I trying to have that upbeat to somebody that might be contemplating that issue and think there's no way out. That hey, it's not too late. Life's okay. It's upbeat. We can do this. We can beat these problems. You know. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of the idea. Sometimes, sometimes it does double. just, I think, you know, take looking at it from a different perspective, and that would mean talking to somebody because things can look really bad where you are, but maybe not in the grand scheme. And it's hard when you get narrow focused, you know. It it it, it is, and I know that the the guy had his problems and stuff, but you're right; it's never too late. But that's where the uh, song um, came from, the the idea of it, and I thought that it was worthy of naming the album after that as well. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So I, and not to pigeonhole you by the one song, but I definitely get like a, like an indie rock feel mm-hmm. sure. on, on what you're writing here and some of the other stuff that, I, that I've heard. Would you say that's kind of accurate in your genre or what, where, where do you think you're pulling from and okay. where do you kind of fit in? That is a, that is a great, great question there because um, you're right. That song there was more of a, um, like you said, indies rock or maybe 90s rockish sound, maybe even. Mm-hmm. Um, I was a teenager in the 90s, you know, so I'm a big uh, Alice in Chains fan. Um, the next song that we play, you guys will hear my Alice in Chains influence huge in it. Um, but I listen anywhere from Alice in Chains and Black Sabbath all the way to right now, my favorite band in the world is Fish. They're a jam band. Oh, um, cool. Their lead yeah. guitar player, Train Astasio. I get all of my licks and my influences biggest from him. Um, So that being said, that is a wide range of influences, but I think that's good because I pull from all of them and the song you heard sounds indie. I also have a song we'll hear later called Be Afraid, and that sounds like a funky, upbeat jam band type of song. Yeah, that's a cool Um, one. So it's kind of hard to put me into one genre, but if I had to, I would just say rock slash indie rock. Yeah, her little blues guitar kind of licky stuff there too. Yeah, it's really cool how you blend the influences. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know if that was going to actually be an issue or not, if you should kind of pick one genre and go with it. But, nah, heck with that. I'm going to pull from all my influences. <laughs> well, should we hear a little bit of the next one? Yeah, so let's hear the um, let's hear Enemy, if you guys have it queued up. I don't know. That's the one that uh, you guys will definitely hear my Alice in Chains influence on. Yeah, I got it here. And bear with me. Okay, here we go. So this one was not on your EP. This yep. one was, uh, was a standalone song, or is this on your new album? This song is coming. This song is going to be released on the album as well. Okay. The new album coming up. Cool. Uh huh. And right. um, we'll talk about um, influences after you play it if you like. Cool. Cool. I have it together now. <laughs> okay. Here's Enemy.
hear Allison Chains in there. Anybody else? Yeah, now that you mention it, yeah. that was one of the ones uh, of yours that I heard earlier that I liked a lot. And uh, I'm a yeah. big Allison Great Chains fan, harmonies. so that's not a surprise now that I know that that's in there. <laughs> <laughs> but I also like the, the, like the there's some synth modulation yeah, that's and some too. stuff going in there. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Um, speaking of that, um, I, I hear a lot of people say, which I don't know if I should take it in a bad way, that my some of the younger kids say, man, that sounds good, but it sounds like it's from the 90s, man. It sounds so old. I'm like, the 90s are old. I know. So they, I started they only trying to make like, my... Uh, all my, all my favorite bands are from the 90s, and I listen to them literally all the time. And it kills me, me to too, think that, that, that it's really not just 10 years ago. It's <laughs> like 30 years ago. Uh, that was a good year. Yeah, that was a they good started year. saying that, was that so I figured... I figured I better try to incorporate some more modern sounds. And that was my attempt. I brought in some synths. <laughs> it works. Yeah, it did work. I, I, it really came out good. And I like that little jam breakdown part too there. Yeah. It's really nice. Yeah. But um, I don't know um, real quick on some uh, influences of why I wrote that song. Um, I grew up in a very uh, Christian home, um, which was fine, but um, kind of got, tiring i was forced to go to church two or three times a week nonstop for 18 years and oh, yada wow. yada yada so some of the lyrics are about um how i disagree with some of the um religions views and things of that nature and, it, and as the listeners go back and listen to it they'll they'll understand what i'm talking yeah, about i'm sure <laughs> i'll leave it at that i'll leave it at that <laughs> cool not that religion is bad i love religion i'm religious but i just don't like it forced yeah i hear that yeah Cool. I had a question going back to your your comment about how you build a song, um, about how you build it. Basically, you build the track from the bottom up and then you mix it from the top down. But by the time you do all your volume balancing and you have the track fully arranged and all you have left to do is sing, is it more or less, do you feel like it's more or less mixed at that point and all you're doing is putting final touches on it? Um, when I go to sing, you mean? Yeah. I usually have um, my singing done um, during my tracking. That's actually part of my volume control. But okay. like, I will usually mix vocals last. I won't. I won't put any um, plugins on my vocals at all until I have the rest of the stuff done. Um, if that's kind of what you're talking about, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I kind of fit it to that, um, which I know kind of will be backwards from what some people do, but it works for me. Um, but that's what I do. I'll get the rest of the song done first and then um, start working on the vocals from there to fit them in nicely there. Yeah, that makes sense. But from, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just thinking on the, the whole 90s thing. And so you're a teenager in the 90s. <laughs> yeah. And and so looking at Alice in Chains and... Smashing Pumpkins. Yep. Okay, Smashing Pumpkins. Perfect. Um, STP no. uh, Ben Folds <laughs> 5 you guys familiar yeah I uh, yeah. love that love that group that's that's why I started learning the piano actually oh okay oh yeah and as a multi-instrumentalist what what are your instruments okay so, so yeah piano, um, guitar and everything you hear in the songs obviously but then to go in a little bit more um, I would call myself a uh, guitarist um, I play lead guitar rhythm guitar um, fairly well that's my main instrument I kind of inherited being able to play bass through that um, as it's set up the same way, basically with the, with the same four strings or five strings, depending on what bass you have. So that was easy to learn. Um, picked up drums through a um, gospel singing quartet that my parents ran for a while and played some drums through there. 
um, that picked up the drums that way. Um, singing, I've been in choir my whole life, so that came natural. Oh, uh, there you go. And um, with the drums, uh, like I told you how I learned them, but with most of my songs, being in a home studio, like a lot of us that are listening, my home studio is small and I don't have a big drum set in there. So I'm <laughs> using things like empty power drum kit, which is a free one if anybody needs yeah, one. That's a good one. I like that yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> that's actually been on every single song we've heard so far of mine. So it, it works. Even though it's free, it can work. The Slate SD5 free version is really nice too. I do like it a lot. Um, I just, I don't know if it's a bigger download or what. My my laptop has a lot of trouble if I don't render the track down after I make it to to regular audio. My, my computer has a lot of trouble from crashing when I have that one up in a big project. Yeah, that's not a bad idea though, to, to make, the, make the decision, commit it like you used to have and to do to tape down. and then keep going. It saves processing, exactly. but it also forces you to not futz with stuff indefinitely, which is a real <laughs> because problem. <laughs> that is a, a big rabbit hole, am I right? I, uh -huh. I, but we're all guilty of it. I'm sure we've all looked up and it was two in the morning and we've been tweaking a snare drum for three hours. I'm like, yeah. okay, what's going yeah. on here? Yeah. <laughs> Matt, <laughs> so it Matt, helps avoid that. you're addicted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but that's uh that's a good way to avoid that. You can go back and do your processing afterwards still, you know, add your EQs and stuff, but it helps take uh, some of the ease off the computer that way. Yeah. I'll, I'll say I got, I've gotten much better about not tweaking snares indefinitely. I like get it so it sounds good and move on to the next <laughs> instrument. Yeah. That's a wrap. Yeah. For the longest time, I wasn't even, um, I was, I was produced my EP that I have out at, um, I have a website, by the way. It's just my name, andystover.com. And you could go there and you can listen to the EP that I already have out right now for free. You can stream the whole thing for free. There's also a couple um, singles up there as well. But all those songs, I didn't even do any processing on the drums outside of the uh, drum bus. I didn't break the drums down into snares, cymbals, or anything. I just I just did my processing on the drum bus. That's all I knew at the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it yeah. was still good enough to sound decent enough to put out to the world. And that was kind of a tip that I had for any home studio guys out there that might just be starting um, don't be afraid to, to, to use what you got until what you got pays for what you want. Boom. And then don't be afraid to share, share the music that you are putting out there because you can do it on budget gear and it can sound decent enough. It is possible. I am living proof. Absolutely. Yeah. Use, where can listeners find you out on social? Sure. So, um, I, I am active on, um, Instagram quite a bit. It's just andy.stover.music. Um, and then, um, my, uh, website, like I spoke about andystover.com. I have a Facebook page as well, Andy Stover music. And then you can listen to my already released stuff on Spotify or any of your favorite streaming platforms. Right on. Yeah. So I'd like to do a little bit, a little bit different this evening and take us out with one of your songs Cool. after we say goodbye <laughs> and we'll just let the meeting sort of end. Which one do we have lined up for us? I have, uh, Be Afraid. Be afraid. Would that okay. be Okay. Yeah, that'd be perfect because we listen to a you little bit. You want to spend like 30 seconds uh, telling about Be yeah, yeah. Afraid? We, yeah, no problem. We um we have listened to my indie rock influence style so far. Be Afraid is going to be a little more of my jam band funk. Um, It's got that nasty little like growl vocals and lyrics that I love. And uh, we'll just let it speak for itself. Thanks so much for having me on, gentlemen. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, listeners. listeners. Andy Stover Music. This song is Be Afraid. You've got an album coming out on... The 12th, okay. and we will have links to your website and social in the show notes. All right, see and listeners, time. and listeners, thanks so yes, much. Thank you very much. And we appreciate you hanging out with <laughs> us. And Andy, enjoy and look forward to next week. Thanks, Cheers. Mark. Thank you.
Well, that wraps up another episode of the Indie Music Podcast. Please like and subscribe, share with your friends, or just leave us a review on iTunes if you like what you've heard. Find our social links and episode guide at IndieMusicCast.com. Until next time, keep creating.